That's it. Oh, come on. Okay, now now everyone can hear and it's cool. So. Is it cool now? Is it good? Are we yeah, good? We're good? Okay. So you guys missed a lot of stuff while Noah failed at getting us online. So I did this big spiel about who the course was intended for and who the exam was written for. So I'll just go over that really quickly. So this course had six people in it. It had, they were all seniors in college and they were all math majors. And then this exam covered the second half of the course. So that went from like Euler's theorem to primitive roots to quadratic residues and quadratic reciprocity to writing numbers as sums of squares. And finally, like integer partitions and the number theory of Ramanujan. And I was like really excited to add this like integer partitions at the end because it's not done in a standard number theory class. Um, okay, and then another thing is the exam was like take home, it was open course materials, and I expected it would take about six hours. And so that was everything that we went over. And now I've got a partial solution for number one because I thought we were going. So I'll just jump in and like highlight what we had talked about. So this first problem was to find the last two digits of the number 27 to the 341 to the 297. So finding the last two digits of a number is equivalent to reducing that number mod 100. So if we were to want to reduce anything mod n and we've got exponentiation involved, then it's likely that we want to use Euler's generalization of Fermat's little theorem. So I recalled that really quick. So let's recall that if the GCD of a and n is equal to 1, then a to the phi of n is congruent to 1 mod n. So what's phi of n? Well, that's called Euler's totient function. And so that counts the number of numbers between 1 and n that are relatively prime to n. So everyone in this class should have been aware of this like standard formula for calculating Euler's totient function, which is phi of n is equal to n times 1 minus 1 over p1 all the way up to 1 minus 1 over pk, where p1 up to pk are the prime factors of n. Okay, well, the benefit of Euler's theorem is that if you are reducing the base mod n, then you reduce the exponent mod phi of n, and that'll carry itself up to any level of exponentiation we have. So here we have three levels of exponentiation. So just kind of as the general format, this is what's going on. We've got a to the b to the c mod n, so that means this whole object is being reduced mod n, in particular the base. This exponent is being reduced mod phi of n, and then the exponent of the exponent is being reduced mod phi of phi of n. So that means we've got some calculations to do involving this Euler totient function. And one last thing before we get started with the calculation, this problem is quite lengthy if you just kind of jam Euler's theorem at it, but if you know something about primitive roots, which the students in the class did, there's actually a trick to do it really, really quickly. Um, I haven't graded the exams because I'm lazy and slow at that kind of stuff sometimes, not all the time, but they're not due for a little bit. Um, so I don't know if anyone used the trick, but it's fairly straightforward without the trick. Okay, so we first calculate phi of 100 because notice 341 will be reduced mod phi of 100. That's equal to 40 by an application of this formula down here. Now we need to calculate phi of phi of 100. That's because this will be reduced mod phi of phi of 100, but that's phi of 40. But now 40 only has two prime factors, two and five again, so that's equal to 40 times half times four fifths. But if you multiply that out, you get the number 16. Okay, great. So that means that 
This number right here, 341, will be reduced mod 40. This number up here, 297, needs to be reduced mod 16. So I'll just put like this as a fact. This is something that a student could just do on a side calculation and include in their solution. So 341 is congruent to 21 modulo 40. And then furthermore, 297 is congruent to 9 modulo 16. Okay, so putting that all together, that means our huge number here, which maybe I'll call capital N, just so that I don't have to keep writing it, um, is congruent to 27 to the 21 to the 9 mod 100. Right, the first exponent was reduced mod 40, the higher exponent was reduced mod uh, 16. Okay, nice. So now I think like we don't really have room to do this calculation here, so let's get rid of this and we'll pick up right there. So let's see, we need to calculate. So right now we've got n is congruent to 27 to the 21 to the 9 mod. 100. Now let's work on this bit right here, this 21 to the 9. So we need to calculate 21 to the 9 mod 40. Okay, so maybe Maybe the best way to do this is to notice that 21 squared is equal to 441. But if you reduce that mod 40, you get this. This is 1 modulo 40. That's pretty easy because this is one more than a pretty obvious multiple of 40. But that means that 21 to the 9 is the same thing as 21 squared to the fourth power times 21. Why did I write it like that? Because 21 squared is 1 mod 40 but that's going to give us 21 mod 40. Okay, so that means that we can essentially just get rid of this ninth power here. 21 to the nine is the same thing as 21 mod 40. That means our number n is in fact just equal to 27 to the power 21 mod 100. Okay, nice. Now, next up, maybe we would notice that 27 is equal to 3 cubed, right? So that allows us to write this as 3 cubed to the 21, but that is 3 to the 63 mod 100. Now we can play this game again. We can reduce 63 mod phi of 100, which is mod 40. That gives us uh, 23, right? So that tells us that this is congruent to 3 to the 23 mod 100. Nice. Okay, so now from here, we would maybe notice that 23 has the following uh, binary expansion, and then we could use successive squaring. So 23 is equal to, let's see, 16 plus 4, plus 2, plus 1. And then by successive squaring, we can calculate 3 to the 16, 3 to the 4, 3 to the 2, and 3 to the 1 pretty quickly. So let's do that. We'll say this is n, and then this is 3 to the n, keeping in mind that this is happening all mod 100. Okay, so I did this calculation kind of on its own. Let's see, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Okay, so let's see, 3 to the 1 is 3, 3 squared is 9, 3 to the 4 is 81, we can't reduce that, yep, mod 100. 3 to the 8, well that's going to be 81 times 81, and then you reduce it mod 100, so that's just a calculation, what you end up with is 61, and then 3 to the 16 ends up being 21. Okay, but using that, we see that we can write this as 3 to the 1 times 3 to the 2 times 3 to the 4 times 3 to the 16 using exponent rules. But that means we're taking the product of, let's see, this number, this number, this number, and this number, and then reducing mod 100. Maybe reducing kind of as you go, and what you'll see is in the end, you get 27 mod 100. 
So maybe that's not super satisfying because the last two digits of this is just 27 mod 100, but that's, that's the answer. Okay, so now I alluded to the fact that there's like a major shortcut built into this problem, like a major shortcut. We could be done in like 30 seconds. So let's uh, look at that real quick. Okay, so here's our shortcut. 40, um, duh, wait, let's maybe reword it a little bit. There is no primitive root mod 40. So this requires you to have like a real good feel for what primitive roots mod n are. Well, let's recall that there are only primitive roots mod n if n is of the form 2, 4, p to the k, or 2 times p to the k, where p is an odd prime. 40 is most definitely not one of those forms, right? It's 8 times 5. <laughs> that was hard. Um, so that's not one of those forms, so it does not have a primitive root. But what does that mean? That means that Euler's theorem can actually be um, cha changed isn't the right word, but maybe refined a little bit in the case of not having a primitive root. And here we could say that a to the phi of, uh, let's see, 40 over 2 is congruent to 1 mod 40 for all A, where the GCD of A and 40 is equal to 1. So what you can do, if N does not have a primitive root, you can replace phi of N here with phi of N over 2. That's the result. I mean, that's like kind of a standard number theory homework problem. I won't go over that part. Okay, so that means that when we're doing this reduction right here, we're allowed to reduce 297 mod phi of 40 over 2. But let's do that. 297, sorry, we can, wait, no, we can reduce this 341 Oh, yeah. sorry, I got ahead of myself real quick. So there's no primitive root mod 40. There's also no primitive root mod 16. And the one mod 16 is the one we really want to work with because this 297 is being reduced mod 16. So let's see, this 297 can be reduced mod 8 instead of mod 16 because of this phi of n over 2 thing. But now if you check this, this is 1 mod 8. So that means that this 27 to the 341, oh, I'm like fouling this whole thing up. Okay, I'm going to step back for a second. Okay, so now let's step back for a second and now let's use this fact on our problem. So that means we've got 27 to the 341 to the 297. So now instead of dividing this by 40 and keeping the remainder, we can divide it by 40 over 2 and keep the remainder. But if we do that, we get 1. So this is 27 to the 1 to the 297, which is the same thing as 27 mod 100. Okay, cool. All right, so I think that's good. Let's move on to the second one, which is a more straight. So this one was a calculation, kind of a straightforward calculation. The second one is a was more of like one of the gimme problems from the exam. So some of the problems were just making sure you knew the definitions and the second problem is one of those. And so this problem comes from video 22 if you're interested in looking at that. And that is to find all quadratic residues mod 23. Okay, so the first thing we can do is use the following fact. 
and that is if p is an odd prime, there are exactly p minus 1 over 2 residues and non-residues. So there are 20, 23 minus 1 over 2, which is 11 quadratic residues and quadratic non-residues, but we're just looking for quadratic residues. And now we'll do this just with a chart. I think that's maybe the best way to do it. So we'll calculate m and then m squared mod 23 and essentially see what the image of the squaring function is. So let's find all of the numbers that we're looking for will be everything relatively prime to 23, so that's just 1 to 22. Then we have to square each of those. So here we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and you might be worried because we're like running out of room, but the next one is 12, and 12 is equal to, let's see, negative 11, mod 23. But notice that negative 11 and 11 will square to the same thing. So that means we really only have to go halfway. And this is a trick we used in class. So I think this was fair here. Notice that 13 will be equal to negative 10. So negative 10 and 10 will square to the same thing. And this is actually inside of the proof that there are p minus 1 over 2 quadratic residues anyway. Okay, so now we can just square each of these and those will give us all our quadratic residues. So let's see, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, 5 squared is 25, which is 2 mod 23, uh, 6 squared is 36, which is 13 mod 23, 7 squared is 49, which is 3 mod 23, 8 squared is 64, which is 18 mod 23, 9 squared is 81, which is 12 mod 23, 10 squared is 100, which is 8, 11 squared is 121, which ends up being 6. So those are all our quadratic residues. We could put them in order if we wanted to. So let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, let's see, 5 is not on that list, but 6 is on this list. Uh, is 7 on that list? No, 7 is not on that list, but 8 is on that list. 9 is on that list. Let's see, 10 is not on that list. 11 is not, but 12 and 13 are. 12 and 13, and then 16 and 18. So let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So those are 11 quadratic residues. We know from the theorem that we should have 11 quadratic residues, so that means we've got them all. Okay, cool. So let's move on. So 3 was also about quadratic residues, but this was like more of a... Uh, proof-based problem, less of a calculation-based problem. So let's fix some natural number k and then show that a is a quadratic residue mod um, p. Yeah, we'll start with p, if and only if is a quadratic residue mod p to the k. Okay. So this, well, one direction of this is pretty easy. The other direction could be pretty tricky, but uh, you want to apply something called Hensel's Lemma which is something we covered in class. This comes from video 15 and 22 from the class. I think 22 is when we did quadratic residues. 15 was when we did Hensel's lemma. Okay, so let's suppose, well, let's rewrite proof here, and let's say that we're doing this forward direction first, and then let's suppose we have something I'll call x1, which is an integer, such that 
x1 squared is congruent to a mod p. Well, that's the definition of a being a quadratic residue. Quadratic residue means perfect square. That's not exactly true. You have to be relatively prime to whatever you're doing, but you know, we, we have that as well. Okay, so now let's maybe rewrite this a little bit. This means that x1 is a solution to the congruence um, x, sorry, f of x equals x squared minus a, which is congruent to zero mod p. So that's pretty clear. We're just putting a different name on it, right? And now we're actually going to prove something stronger than the result that we need. Notice we only need this thing to have a solution mod p to the k for this fixed k, but we'll prove that it has a solution for all n. So let's point that out. So, so we will prove that f of x congruent to 0 mod p to the n has a solution for all natural numbers n. And that will include our fixed natural number k. OK, so notice that our base case is done. I guess I should point out that we're doing this by induction. Our base case is done because, I mean, that's the given, right? That's the left-hand side of this if and only if statement. So that means we need to make an induction hypothesis. Hypothesis. So our induction hypothesis will be um, we have some, maybe call it m, bigger than or equal to 1, such that there exists um, xm, which is an integer, with f evaluated at xm is congruent to 0 modulo p to the m. So I'm using m as my like inductive index here because k has been taken up by this right here. OK, so that's our induction hypothesis. Now let's also notice that um, we have f prime evaluated at xm is equal to 2 times xm. And that is not congruent to 0 mod p. OK. So why is that? Well, that's because of a couple of things. That's because p is an odd prime, which I forgot to write up there, but it is in the exam. So that means that 2 is not congruent to 0 mod p. And then also, xm is not congruent to 0 mod p. Because if, if xm were congruent to 0 mod p, then it wouldn't satisfy this original like equation, right? So let's write that down. So if xm were congruent to 0 mod p, then we would have a um, then we would have the GCD of A with P to the M is not equal to 1, which means that A could not be a quadratic residue mod P to the M. And that's like one of the things that we're assuming. Okay, so we've got this. Now let's see what the next step will be. Well, let's look at what we've got carefully. So let's maybe erase this. Okay, so we've got some polynomial that has a solution mod p to the m. And if we plug that solution into the derivative of that polynomial, you do not get 0 mod p. But that is set up for an application of, of Hensel's lemma. So we'll apply Hensel's lemma. And that gives us, so giving us a unique, I'll call it xm plus 1, which actually has the form xm plus some other stuff. That other stuff doesn't really matter for this proof because all we're looking for is a solution in the first place. We don't care what that solution looks like. 
There's a unique xm plus one such that f evaluated at xm plus one is congruent to zero mod p to the m plus one. So we were able to boost that root from a root modulo p to the m to a root modulo p to the m plus one. That's the whole idea of Hensel's, Hensel's lemma. It like lifts the root throughout the powers of the primes. But now recalling what f was, this means that x to the m plus one squared is congruent to a mod p to the m plus one. But that essentially tells us that a is a quadratic residue mod p to the n for all natural numbers n, right? That's the, in, the induction proves that. But if it's true for all n, then it's true for our fixed k over here. Okay, good. So that is the forward direction of this proof. So if you're like really familiar with Hensel's lemma, it's really not that bad. Once you just get it in the right, um, once you get it in the right setting and apply Hensel's lemma, it's really, really fast. That being said, I could see a student maybe like on accident reinventing, reinventing a very special case of Hensel's lemma in order to prove this. And that would be another way to do it. That would be kind of a bummer though. Okay, so now uh, let's do this reverse direction. So in other words, A is a quadratic residue mod P to the K, and we want to show that it's a quadratic residue mod PK, or sorry, mod P. This is actually pretty quick. So let's suppose we have X, which is an integer, such that X squared is congruent to A mod P to the K. Right? That's what it means to be a quadratic residue mod p to the k. Now let's use the definition of congruence mod n, essentially. This means that p to the k divides x squared minus a. But if p to the k divides x squared minus a, that means p most definitely divides x squared minus a. Right? But uh, that tells us that x squared is congruent to a mod p. So that's all, that's all there is to it. So that means A is a quadratic residue mod P. So notice if it's a quadratic residue mod any power of a prime, it's a quadratic residue mod all of the powers of the prime by like putting these both directions together. Okay. That was the, maybe like, Proofiest problem on the exam, maybe. Okay, so four. So four is a classic quadratic reciprocity example. So let's just uh, recall Gauss's theorem of quadratic reciprocity real quick. So if P and Q are odd primes, I'll say that, but I won't write it, then the Legendre symbol P by Q times the Legendre symbol Q by P is equal to one if P or Q is congruent to one mod four, and it's equal to negative one if P is congruent to Q is congruent to three mod four. Let's recall what this, what this Legendre symbol means. So A by P is equal to one if A is a quadratic residue and it's equal to negative one if it's not a quadratic residue. And then we also have some nice formulas like A B by P is equal to A by P B by P. So that's one of the rules of the Legendre symbol. And then A by P P uh, is equal to B by P if A is congruent to B mod P. So you can reduce the top part of the Legendre symbol mod P. Okay, so now this is gonna go pretty fast now that we've like recalled all of these rules here. So the goal was to reduce four, six, three by six, five, nine. First you check that they're both primes. The bottom part has to be a prime for the Legendre symbol to make sense in the first place. 
There's something called the Jacobi symbol, which has a composite in the bottom, but we didn't cover that in the class. It's a pretty easy extension. Um, the top part doesn't have to be a prime, but in this case, the top part is a prime. Not only are these both prime, but they're both congruent to three mod four. So you can check that. It's not too hard to check. That means if we turn it upside down, we'll pick up a minus sign. And essentially, you always want to turn it upside down because you want the larger thing to be on top so you can reduce it mod the smaller thing. That way you have like this cascade of the numbers getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So here we've got minus 659 by 463. Now you just reduce 659 mod 463. That's just a calculation. So that equals negative 196 by 463. And then you look at the prime factorization of 196, and you'll see that the prime factorization of 196 is 2 squared times 7 squared. But actually, that's really good news. That means that 196 is equal to 14 squared, which maybe like you recognize that as a perfect square immediately. That means we've got minus 14 squared over 463. But now we're done, right? Because this symbol asks, is the top part a perfect square? But we just wrote it as a perfect square, so the answer is yes. That means this symbol gives us a positive one, but it's attached to this minus sign, so in the end we get a minus one. So that means we don't have to keep flipping and moving things around to simplify it. Although you could, you just spend a lot of time and come up with the same answer. Okay. Okay, so the next problem is like one of my favorite types of problems regarding like quadratic reciprocity and that's deciding what types of primes admit certain numbers as quadratic residues. This comes from video 23 and 24. So let's see, what number is this? Five. Five, so here's the goal. Categorize primes P. I should really be more careful about this and say odd primes. It's just that the even prime is not super interesting. Everything is a quadratic residue. So categorize odd primes P such that minus seven is a, a quadratic residue modulo P. In other words, it's a perfect square mod P. So, Using Legendre symbol, that means we want to find when uh, minus 7 by p is equal to 1. Remember, minus 7 by p being equal to 1 means that minus 7 is a perfect square mod p. Okay, so let's, well, let's do this. So minus 7 by p, we can split that apart into 7 by p times minus 1 by p. Right, just by the factoring rule. But here's one of the nice things. We know this. Well, we know the classification of primes that makes this equal to one or negative one. So let's write that down. This is equal to one if P is congruent to one mod four. And this is equal to negative one if P is congruent to three modulo four, right? But now let's do the flip a here because since P is arbitrary, we want it on the top so we can reduce it mod seven. So this is gonna be equal to just plus P by seven if P is congruent to one mod four, right? But it's gonna be equal to minus P by seven if P is congruent to three mod four. And so that's by Gauss's theorem of quadratic reciprocity. If one of these is one mod four, you can flip it with no, no penalty. But if they're both three mod four, you have to pick up a minus sign. But check it out, like seven is already three mod four, so it all depends on the congruence of P mod four. Uh, but now look at this. If P is one mod four, you get a positive sign from both of these. 
If P is 3 mod 4, you get a minus sign from both of these. But minus 1 times minus 1 is positive 1. That means that you can turn this minus 7 by P into P by 7 regardless. Because in this case, you just get 1 times 1. In this case, you get minus 1 times minus 1. It cancels either way. So the summary of that step is that minus 7 by P is equal to P by 7 regardless of what the prime is. You just, you just get lucky, right? Right here, the minus signs cancel. Okay, nice. Now, we just want to look at the quadratic uh, residues mod 7. And I think that's maybe best done with a chart. You know, you make a lot of charts, right? So n squared mod 7. So what do we need to do? We need to square the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Or we really just need to uh, square the numbers 1, 2, 3 because 4 is negative 3 and that's going to square the square of the same thing as 3. 1 squared is 1. Uh, 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 6. 3 squared is 9, which is 2. So there, my quadratic residues are 1, 2, and 4. So th that means this is going to be equal to 1 if P is congruent to 1, 2, 4 mod 7. And it's going to be equal to negative 1 if P is congruent to anything else. So what will that be? 3, 5, 6 mod 7. So categorize the primes P such that negative 7 is a quadratic residue mod P. So through these two steps of simplification, we have gotten it down to the following classification. These primes up here allow 7 to negative 7 to be a quadratic residue. Okay, great. So number 6. Okay, so how about how I totally messed up that primitive root argument on the first problem? Now we're going to have another problem about primitive roots, but it's more straightforward. Okay, so let's, uh, this is six. So solve using primitive roots. Okay, so we've got two things to solve. Let's write them over here. So 6 to the x congruent to 11 mod 17. That's one of them. And the other one is 7 times x to the fifth is congruent to 2 mod 17. Okay, so that means we're going to look for a primitive root mod 17. So there's a trick to check if things are primitive roots. So let's Let's outline what we're doing. So find a primitive root mod 17. So that means you need to do the following. It's called like Euler's test for primitive roots or somebody's test for primitive roots. I don't really remember. So we need to check R. It's actually to the phi of 17 over q, but I'll just write it as 17 minus 1 over 2, sorry, over q, where q runs through all primes that divide, uh, well, 17 minus 1 in this case. And you want to look for a number r with, where this is not congruent to 1 mod 17 in this case. That's your test for if things are primitive roots. So let's look at this. So 17 minus 1 is equal to 16. So that means q equals 2 is the only prime that we need to check. So that means we need to look at r to the 8 mod 17 for different values of r and the first one that we find where r to the 8 is not equal to 1 that means that the order of that r is equal to 16 it achieves the highest possible order but that means it's a primitive root okay so let's try 2 first so 2 is often a primitive root there's like actually a big conjecture talking about how often 2 is a primitive root 
So let's look at, uh, we need to look at 2 to the 8 mod 17. That's not too hard to calculate. Notice that's 2 to the 4 squared mod 17, but 2 to the 4 is 16, but 16 is negative 1. So that's negative 1 squared, which is 1 mod 17. But that's like a bummer for us. That means that 2 is not a primitive root. So that means we move on. We look at 3 to the 8, uh, which is equal to 3 to the 4 squared, which is equal to uh, 80, 81. Anyway, I'm not going to do the whole calculation. This gives us 16 mod 17 in the end. So that means uh, 3 is a primitive root. Okay, so now that 3 is a primitive root, we want to make like a primitive root chart for all the powers of 3 mod 17 so that we can use that to solve this. So let's do that in this zone over here so we can solve the problem in that zone. So this part is not like super fun, but you know, when there's like a really hard exam question on the exam, it's nice to have questions like this to like jump back to to kind of rest on. <laughs> okay, so let's see. We need to calculate n, 3 to the n for, let's see, maybe uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. We don't have to go past 15 because we know 3 to the 16 will be 1 by Fermat's little theorem. I'm just going to read this off. This gives us uh, 3, 9, 3 to the 3 ends up being 10. Well, that's obvious because that's 27, which is 10 more than 17. And then here we have 13, 5, 15 to the 7th power is 11, 16, this is 4, to the 10th power is 8, to the 11th power you get 7. That means 3 to the 11 is 7 mod 17. 3 to the 12 is 4. 3 to the 13 is 12. 3 to the 14 is 2. And then this is 6. So obviously doing that in real time would take a little bit more. But like essentially what would, what would you do here? Okay, so let's say we were at this step right here. So we knew 3 to the 6 was equal to 15. Now we would multiply this by 3, we would get 45, and then we would reduce 45 mod 17 to get 11. Notice 45 is 11 more than 34, which is a multiple of 17. And then we would keep going. Multiply this by 3 to get 33 and then reduce mod 17 to get 16, and then so on and so forth. So that's how you can do it, you know, saving some time, just reduce after every step. Okay, now we're ready for this. So we will replace six with what? That. So we'll replace six with three to the 15. So we'll write this as three to the 15 to the x, is congruent to 11, but let's see, 11 was 3 to the 7. 3 to the 7 mod 17. But that means we have 3 to the 15x is congruent to 3 to the 7 mod 17. Now we can take the discrete logarithm or the index. We can just extract exponents. That's going to give us 15x is congruent to 7 mod phi of 17, which is 16. Okay, but now look at this. 15 is 1 less than 16, but that makes it negative 1. So I can erase that 15 and put just negative 1, but now I can multiply both sides by negative 1. That gives me x is congruent to negative 7 mod 16, but we probably like that written as a number between 0 and 16. That means x is congruent to 9 mod 16, just by adding like 16 to that, right? Okay, cool. Now we'll do the same kind of thing over here. So let's start by saying that x must be equal to 3 to the y for some 
value of y, right? That's how you use primitive roots to solve these polynomial types, types of equations. I guess it's really like you're taking a discrete root. It's not really a full-fledged polynomial. And then let's look at each of these parts. So 7 is what? So 7 is 3 to the 11. So we've got 3 to the 11 times 3 to the y to the 5. So that's 3 to the 5y is congruent to 2. But 2 is 3 to the 14. So this is 3 to the 14 mod 17. But now you can smush these together using exponent rules. That gives us 3 to the 5y plus 11. But now you can take the discrete logarithm or the index or whatever, and that's going to give us 5y plus 11 is congruent to 14 modulo 16, right? Modulo phi of 17. Okay, so now what can we do? We can just do arithmetic, right? So this means 5y is congruent to 3 modulo 16. But now what's 5 inverse mod 16? So maybe 5 times 13 is 65. Yeah, and 65 is one more than a multiple of 16, right? It's one more than 64. So let's multiply both sides by 13. So 13 by 5 is 16, which is one mod set. 13 times 5 is 65, which is one more than multiple of 16. That makes it 1. And then 13 times 3 is 39. But 39 mod 16 is 7, right? So 7 mod 16. But we're not done, right? Because we wanted x, which was 3 to the y. So x is equal to 3 to the 7, which is congruent to, let's see, our chart over here, 11. So we've got 11 mod 16. OK, so that's how we solve each of these. 17. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Thanks, I was corrected. This should be mod 17 because we're out of the exponent world here. We're back into the base world. Okay, sweet. So I was like talking with the number theory class and we decided, well, we were like musing as to what types of classic proofs should a math major just like kind of know by heart and be able to show their friends at any point? And I posed the statement that maybe like one of these infinitely many primes proofs would be one of them. And so that's what number seven is. It's one of these infinitely many primes proofs. I think they're like really classic, especially maybe if you've taken a number theory class, you should know a couple of them that involve quadratic residues. And this one does. So let's see, seven. So prove there are infinitely many primes of the form 8k plus 3. So there's this thing called Dirichlet's theorem that says there are infinitely many primes of the form uh, mk plus n, where m and n are relatively prime, but that requires like kind of a lot of work. Um, it's not like undergraduate number theory class type problem or type theorem to go over, but you can prove a lot of these one-offs using more elementary methods. Okay, so let's look at the proof of this. We're gonna start in a fairly standard format by assuming by way of contradiction that we only have finitely many, and I'll say it like this. By way of contradiction, assume all primes and instead of saying 8k plus 3, I'll say are congruent to 3 mod 8 are on the following list, p1, p2, all the way up to pn. So in other words, we're assuming that there are only finitely many such primes. Now next, we'll set x equal to the product of these primes. So x is equal to p1 up to pn, and then we'll set n 
equal to x squared plus 2. Okay, nice. So maybe some important observations to start off with are as follows. So let's first observe that x squared is congruent to 1 mod 8. I mean, maybe that requires a little bit of argument, but let's notice that each of these are congruent to 3 mod 8, but that means each of them squared are congruent to 1 mod 8. So this is 3 mod 8. If you square it, it's 9 mod 8, which is 1 mod 8. But notice squaring x is the same thing as squaring each of these and multiplying them. So suffice it to say, x squared is congruent to 1 mod 8. That means that n squared it, sorry, n is congruent to, well, it's 1 plus 2, is 3 mod 8. Okay, nice. Now, let's keep that in the back of our minds because that's going to be important. Um, now, next up, we want to say that we've got a prime that divides n. So let's suppose p is a prime with p divides n. So a priori, we do not know the type of p. p could be congruent to 1, 3, 5, or 7 mod 8. It could be any of those possibilities. Obviously, we want to prove that p is 3 mod 8, which we'll get to our contradiction, but we can't do that just yet. Okay, but if p divides n, that's the same thing as saying that n is congruent to 0 mod p. But we're calling the n as x squared plus 2. That tells us that x squared is congruent to negative 2 mod p, right? Just like we're writing the same thing a couple of different ways. This is a really informative way to write, you know, this fact because it allows us to say that negative 2 is a perfect square mod p. In other words, negative 2 is a quadratic residue mod p. That means that this Legendre symbol, 2 by p is equal to 1, right? Because that's the question, is negative 2 a perfect square mod p? Yes. Now, this implies, and I'm not going to work this out because this was done in class, I think in one of the videos, and as a group work exercise in class and several other places. I'll just put similar to... What was it? Question five? I don't even remember. The last one of the previous questions that we did with minus seven by P. So similar to previous, that implies that P is congruent to one or three mod eight. Right? So up here, when we assumed P divided eight, P could be one, three, five, or seven. But after this observation, we've gotten it down to P is only one or three. So let's look at each case. So, so first of all, so what if P is congruent to 3 mod 8? Okay. Well, if P is congruent to 3 mod 8, then P equals PI for some I between 1 and N. Well, why is that? Because we assumed that all primes that were 3 mod 8 are on that list. Okay, well, let's see what that gives us. That means pi divides n, and pi also divides x squared, given how x was formed, right? So pi is one of the primes here. But putting this together, that means pi divides n minus x squared, which is the same thing as saying pi divides 2, which is the same thing as saying pi equals 1 or 2. But can't be equal to 1 because 1's not a prime. Can't be equal to 2 because 2 is not 3 mod 8. So that means we have come to a contradiction. Um, well, actually, no, we haven't come to a contradiction yet. We have shown that P is not congruent to 3 mod 8. Okay, so via this argument right here, we excluded the possibilities of P being 5 or 7. By this argument right here, we excluded the possibility of P being 3. So that means all that's left is P is congruent to 1 mod 8. 
Okay, but that means that all primes, all primes dividing in R1 mod 8, right? None of them can be 3 mod 8 by what we just showed. None of them can be 5 or 7 mod 8 by this up here. They all have to be 1 mod 8. But if all the primes dividing in are 1 mod 8, that means n itself is 1 mod 8. Because if you multiply a bunch of things that are 1 mod 8 to each other, that's a closed set, right? That's going to give you something that's 1 mod 8. So n is congruent to 1 mod 8. But remember this observation that we did at the very, very beginning that we haven't touched for a while? n is congruent to 3 mod 8. We have contradicted that observation. So there's our contradiction. So, well, where's the problem? Notice that all of this was logic. The only assumption we made was up here where we assumed there were finitely many primes, so that must be not true. There are not finitely many primes of this form, which means there are infinitely many primes of this form, so that finishes this proof. Okay, so like I was like saying earlier, I think a proof like this is something that kind of like every math major should be able to tell their friends at any point in time. You know, there's not a lot of like, memorization type stuff that should be done in mathematics, but I think it's really nice to like keep one of these in mind at all times because they're so beautiful. Okay. Let's look at the next one. Chris Sadowski there? Uh, I have not seen him. Blackman Redfin's here. Oh. And my brother and a couple Hi, Steve Child. people from this link was here for a while. And, oh, nice. Yeah. So, I think it's like Jalen or Terrell here. I haven't seen them in the chat, but I'm not being watching. Yeah. So which are expressible? Is it Abel or Ibel? What does the chat say? What letter goes there? Mm, no one's saying anything. Cool. Well, we're all math people. <laughs> cool story, guys. <laughs> okay, so which are expressible as the sum of two squares? I'm not going to write the numbers down real quick. I'm just going to recall the fact. So this was proven in our class. Um, we did, you know, I actually forgot to put the next type of problem on the exam. I probably should have, but we did two days with sums of squares type things. We did sums of two squares and then we did quadratic forms, which I think is like a little bit, I mean, obviously the sum of four squares result is really, really classic, but I really wanted to do the quadratic forms because it allows students to, um, review linear algebra quite a bit. I should have put a quadratics forms problem on the exam, but I kind of forgot. This is video 26. Okay, so here's a fact. N can be written as N equals X squared plus Y squared, where X and Y are integers. Uh, if and only if um, every every uh, prime that is three mod four uh, dividing in occurs with an even exponent. Yeah, it's not that there's an even number of primes that are 3 mod 4, it's that each individual prime that is 3 mod 4 has an even exponent on it. Okay, so, so which can be expressed as the sum of two squares? So we'll do 6 factorial, 10 factorial, and then the classic 1989 to the 1989. Okay, so 6 factorial, we can write that as 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, 
but then we want to express that as a prime factor. So that's five times three squared times two to the four. Okay, so let's look at the prime factors. Five is one mod four, so that doesn't restrict us at all. Three is three mod four, but it's got an even exponent but that's the only one that's three mod four and it has an even exponent, so the answer here is yes. So let's express it as a sum of squares. So we can take five, that's equal to four, four squared, that's equal to two squared plus one. Uh, three squared is already squared and two to the fourth, that's essentially already squared, that's four squared. So that's three times four squared, that's 12 squared. Now we can multiply this through and we'll get 24 squared plus 12 squared. I have to admit, like, this could be more difficult where you have to use that rule for uh, the product of two sums of squares is a sum of squares where, you know, you just don't have individual squares here, but, you know, that's kind of neither here nor there. Um, now let's look at 10 factorial. Well, I'll just jump to the prime factorization because there's not a ton that goes on here. So you get seven times five squared times three to the fourth times two to the seven. So the answer here is no, and that's because of this guy right here. Seven is three mod four, but it only occurs with a one of an exponent. One is obviously odd. Okay, so now what about 1989 to the 1989? So notice this odd power right here is not gonna help us at all, providing us with an even exponent for our bad primes. So we better hope that 1989 factors nicely, but it turns out that it doesn't. 1989 is equal to uh, three squared times, oh no, sorry, it does. <laughs> 13 times 17. Uh, let's see, this is one mod four. Uh, this is also one mod four. So I should say this is all to the 1989. So there's only this thing, which is three mod four, but in the end, it occurs with an even exponent. It occurs with the exponent two times 1989. So the answer here is yes. But we're not gonna write it as a sum of squares. I don't think that would be very fun. Okay. Okay, so this, these last three problems are about integer partitions. Well, one of them doesn't really look like it's about integer partitions, but it is. Um, and like I said at the beginning of this whole game, I really like add, I, this is the first time I'd ever added a little section on integer partitions to an elementary number three class, and I really liked it. Did students like it? It was okay. I, I enjoyed it. It was okay. Uh, um, anyway, I'm gonna keep doing it because you know, part of it's for my enjoyment. Um, okay, so let's see, nine. Let's draw, draw, draw a Ferrer's diagram and find the conjugate partition. And for each of these, so let's say this one first, five plus two plus two plus one. So that's a partition of 10, right? So that's equal to 10, okay. So recall what the Ferrer's diagram is. You take each of the parts and you put that many dots on each row. So if you were to write this as a tuple, which when you're defining integer partitions, you often write these things as tuples. In this case, it's a four tuple, but you know, when you're actually working with them and you often just write the addition problem. So anyway, the Ferrer's diagram goes like this. We've got five dots, one, two, three, four, five on the first row, two on the second row, two on the third row, one on the fourth row. So it's a partition with five parts. First part is five, the second 
middle two parts are two and the last part is one. Okay, so the conjugate partition is what you get from reflecting this picture by this diagonal. So, let's see, that reflection will give us the following picture. So rows become columns. So instead of having a row of five dots, we've got a column of five dots. Then a column of two dots, a column of two dots, a column of one dot. So we end up with that. So let's see, what is that? That's four plus three plus one plus one plus one. Okay. Nice. Now let's do the other one. There's lots of there's lots of really cool stuff that we did in class with these fairs diagrams. Um, but we kind of did everything in class that would be like that was a reasonable difficulty for a problem. We showed that, you know, like partitions into odd and distinct parts, the number of those was equal to the number of partitions that were self-conjugate and stuff like that. Everything that we didn't do was actually very, very hard, which is why these problems are just fairly straightforward. And also this was like meant to be kind of a rest problem for the exam. So let's see, three plus three plus three plus two plus one. So that's a partition of nine, 10, 11, 12. So let's see, that fares diagram will have dot, 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 dot. Dot, 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 and then two, and then one. So we want to reflect, that's terrible. We want to reflect by that pink line. So that'll give us what? That'll give us one, two, three, four, five in the first row, and then two, three, four in the second row, three in the third row and that's it. Is that right? Yeah, and then what partition is that? That is uh, five plus four plus three. Okay, so that's the conjugate partition for this guy right here. Okay, nice. Okay, uh, I don't have my video number for that. Okay, last two. So they involve generating functions. Um, this first one, it's like using generating functions to prove a partition identity. And the last one is not really related to anything like, not immediately related to partitions or anything, but really more just dealing with these hypergeometric functions and some product identities, which are going to be extended to the end of the videos where I finally prove Rogers or Monajan identities. I have one more video to prove to prove to to record to prove those identities. And so that was like towards that goal. Okay, so let's see what this last problem is. So it said or this next to last problem is. So this is the number of partitions of n into distinct parts that are also congruent to one, two, four, mod seven, okay? So this equals the number of partitions of n into parts that are not necessarily distinct that are congruent to 1, 9, 11, mod 14. Okay. Okay, so I mean, let's just do a quick example of a partition of this first type. Okay, so that means we're allowed to use numbers that are one, two, four, mod seven, but we're not allowed to use them more than once. So for instance, we could have something like this, two plus four plus uh, eight plus nine. That would be an example of a partition that satisfies this rule, right? So nine is two mod seven, eight 
is one mod seven, four is obviously four mod seven, and two is obviously two mod seven. So that is a partition that satisfies this rule. Uh, let's see, what is that equal to? 10, 10 plus 23? 23, so that's a partition of 23 that satisfies this rule. Now, the number of partitions of n into parts that are 1, 9, or 11 mod 14, that doesn't have to satisfy this rule. So in this case, you could have something like 11 plus 11 plus 1. So that's also equal to 23. And that would be an example of this. So these are congruent to 1 and 11 mod 14, um, but they don't have to be distinct. Okay, so let's give this a name. So let's say this number right here is P1 of N. So that's how many guys are in this box. And then this number down here is P2 of N. That's the number of guys in that box. Okay, so we're gonna use generating functions. This is one of those things that's fairly simple if you've done a couple, but it can look very mystifying if you haven't done any of them. So the generating function for partitions of this type, that would be the sum of P1 n Q to the n. Okay, so that equals the following product. It's an infinite product and it looks like this. 1 plus Q times 1 plus Q squared times 1 plus Q to the fourth. The next one will be 1 plus q to the 8, the next one will be 1 plus q to the 9, the next one will be 1 plus q to the 11. Like I said, that's an infinite product. Okay, so let's maybe just talk our way through that. So this portion of the product represents using the number 1 in the partition either 0 times or 1 time. This represents using the number 2 either 0 times or 1 time. Now you can see where we're going. This represents using the number four zero times or one time, the number eight zero times or one time, the number nine zero times or one time, and so on and so forth. But we need an infinite product because we're allowed to use all numbers that are one, two, four, mod seven. But we're not allowed to use them more than once. That's why we truncate each of these, what would generally be infinite series as like short polynomials. Okay, so next up is I'm gonna rewrite this line exactly, but I'm gonna leave some space. So I'm gonna write this as one plus Q, then a little bit of space, one plus Q squared, a little bit of space, one plus Q to the fourth, one plus Q to the eight, and then one plus Q to the nine. And then I'm going to insert a version of 1 between each of these products. So here I'm going to insert 1 minus Q. That means I need a 1 minus Q down here. I'm going to here put a 1 minus Q squared, then a 1 minus Q squared down here. Here's going to be a 1 minus Q to the fourth. Here will be a 1 minus Q to the eight. Those guys need to be downstairs as well. One minus Q to the four, one minus Q to the eight. Okay, nice. But now these two multiply together to a very nice object, one minus Q squared. Now we can see where things will cancel. This one minus Q squared will cancel this one minus Q squared, but we'll get to that. And then these two multiply to a very nice object, one minus Q to the fourth. These two multiply to one minus Q to the eight. These two multiply to one minus Q to the 16. These two, which I haven't written the next one because I ran out of room, will multiply to one minus Q to the 18, right? Okay, nice. So now let's see what we're left with. In the numerator, we have one minus Q squared, one minus Q to the fourth, 1 minus q to the 8, 1 minus q to the 16, 1 minus q to the 18. What will the next one will be? The next one will be 1 minus q to the 22. Because it'll be related to multiplying in 1 minus q to the 11 over 1 minus q to the 11. Okay, then what do we have in the denominator? And that goes on forever. Then in the denominator we have 1 minus q 1 minus q squared, 
uh, one minus Q to the fourth, one minus Q to the eight, one minus Q to the nine, one minus Q to the 11 will be the next one. And then so on and so forth. But now some stuff cancels, lots of stuff cancels in fact. So this cancels with this, this cancels with this, this cancels with this, this is gonna cancel with something further down the line. You can see, you can see it coming uh, because we will eventually have something in the numerator that will multiply by that. So this is gonna cancel with something down the line. Um, let's see, likewise, this 18 is gonna cancel with something down the line and that 22 is gonna cancel with something down the line. So let's see what we're left with. We're left with one over one minus Q times one minus Q to the nine times one minus Q to the 11 and then what will the next one be? Well, it'll be uh, one minus Q to the 15, and then one minus Q to the what, what, 14 plus nine is 23, and then so on and so forth. But look at what we've got. We've got this one minus Q to the all numbers that are one, nine, 11, mod 14 in the denominator but that is exactly the generating function for this second type. So that's the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of p to n, q to the n. Okay, but now uh, comparing sides of this equation and powers of q, we see that p1 of n equals p2 of n because they're attached to the same power of q on both sides of this equation. So we've just proven this box here. Now, I think you might be worried because we just have a bunch of dot, dot, dot pattern thing happening here and that seems like a little bit problematic. And I will admit, admit that it looks a little bit less precise than normal. You could write this out all in product notation and see everything that cancels, but if you read a paper on integer partitions in Q-series, they're gonna write it out like this. They're not gonna write it out with the product notation necessarily. This is a really common way of writing these things, these proofs out. Okay, so there we did it, right? I really like these. Um, Noah just thinks they're okay. All right. He's fired. Noah's giving a talk at the big math conference in January. I don't know if anyone out there is like, a uh, math student in the US and goes to like the big math conference in January, um, should come see Noah's talk. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> it is a lot of pressure. <laughs> okay. Last problem. Is that true? Yeah, there's a lot of It's a lot shorter than a teaching calculus two all at once. Okay, so the last problem was to show this. The sum n goes from zero to infinity of z to the n over this symbol q n, this pock hammer symbol q n, I'll recall what that is, is equal to one over z infinity. Okay, so this is in the realm of like the mathematics of Ramanujan or hypergeometric functions or like maybe some product identities. As you'll see, so I finished recording the last video for this number, no, the next to last video for this number theory series. It's, there will be 35 videos in all. And in the last one, I proved the Rogers Ramanujan identity. And that's one of these some product identities. And that uses like things like this. If you look at the exam, it says prove it from scratch. That's because this is like a really, really quick corollary of something that was proven in one of the videos that I did and that we used in class called the Q binomial theorem or something. Um, and I wanted like more of an outline of that proof for this special case so that uh, you know some practice could be used for deriving these identities instead of just like setting something equal to something. Anyway, so that's, that's the whole thing here. Okay, so let's recall some definitions here. 
So this no, this thing a n, which is sometimes also called a like semicolon q n. So that is the product one minus a times one minus a times q, all the way up to one minus a times q to the n minus one. So up here, q is equal to a, so that's really just one minus q, one minus q squared, all the way up to one minus q to the n power. You can kind of think about this like some sort of thing that's kind of following the pattern of a geometric series or something. Okay, so, and then infinity, well, that's essentially just the limit of this as n goes to infinity. So a infinity, that is uh, a colon q infinity. So that is a one minus a, one minus a q forever. Okay, so the standard strategy here is this. We're gonna set a function f z q equal to the product side. So notice this is an infin infinite product, this is inf infinite sum. That's why these things are called sum product identities. So this is going to be this one over z infinity. Let's write that out a little bit. That is equal to one over one minus z times one over one minus z q all the way, well, let's maybe write one more down, one minus one minus, one over one minus z q squared, and then an infinite product. So what I wanna do from here is factor this one minus, one over one minus z term out, and notice that what is left over is our original function where z has been replaced with zq. So this is f of zq, q, right? Yeah, because it's like, instead of one minus, instead of starting from one minus z, you start with one minus zq, and then you just multiply by q each time. That doesn't really change. Okay, so that gives us like, you wanna think about this as some sort of recursion identity on the function, some sort of functional equation type thing. Okay, now from here, we want to write f z q as the sum, as n goes from zero up to infinity of a n z to the n. And then our goal is to find this a n. So we'll want a n to be this thing over here, one over q n. That'll finish the whole thing off, right? Um, maybe another thing to note, which is like pretty like quote unquote obvious, is that a zero equals the number one. It's not like super trivial, but it's not really that complicated. Notice that if you were to expand this right hand side as like an infinite product of infinite geometric series, and look at the coefficient of z to the zero, in other words, the constant term, that constant term would be one, right? So that's how you wanna visualize this. This is like one plus z plus z squared plus dot 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 dot. This guy right here is one plus z q plus z squared q squared plus dot 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 dot, and they're all of that form. So if I were to multiply all of those out, just multiply them all out, Pick out the constant term. That constant term would be a zero. That constant term is clearly one because it's just one times one times one times one infinitely many times. So I think that's a fairly reasonable way to see that observation. Okay, nice. Now what we'll do is take this functional identity that we just derived and plug it in for our series. I'm gonna take this one minus z and push it up here though, and then maybe change the sides. So here we have f z q q is equal to one minus z f z q. That's exactly this like blue underline. Now I'll replace these with that uh, power series. So that gives us the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of a n q n z n, right? So that's this. We've replaced all the z's with z times q. Uh, and then equals one minus z, the sum n goes from zero to infinity of a n q n. 
It's just our straight up expansion. Okay, well let's multiply this out a little bit. That's gonna give us this sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of a n q n z n equals the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of uh, a n q n minus, oh sorry, that should, that should be a n z n, close one, uh, minus sum n goes from zero to infinity a n z n plus one. Okay, next up, we want to make the following observation, which I'll just say in words and erase some things on the board. The only two constant terms in this line right here occur in this sum and in this sum, and they're connected to n equals zero. So notice n equals zero will just give us a zero here because we've got stuff to the zero power. It'll just give us a zero here because we've got stuff to the zero power. Over here, if we plug in n equals zero, we'll get z to the one power, right? So that means I can essentially just subtract a zero from both sides and I switch that from starting at zero to starting at one. Okay. Now, next up, I can re-index this thing by replacing n with n minus one. That means we're gonna change the starting point to n equals one. That'll change this index to n minus one and that'll change this index to n. So we've got something like that. But now we can push these guys together back on the right hand side and that'll give us this sum as n goes from one to infinity of a n minus a n minus one z to the n, right? That's what we get when we push those together. But now we can equate coefficients of z on both sides of the equation. So we've got a n q to the n is the same thing as a n minus a n minus one. So let's write that up here. Okay, let's recall that a naught was one. And then writing these purple boxes up here, we get a n q to the n is equal to a n minus a n minus one. And then just to sort of reiterate, this was equal to uh, the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of a n. Okay, so now let's maybe solve this for a n. I'll maybe move this one over here and move this one over here. Yeah, that'll give us what? That will give us a n times one minus q to the n equals a n minus one. Right, but that gives us a n equals one over one minus q to the n times a n minus one. Now we can apply this recursion over, or sorry, we can apply this reduction over and over and over again. I'll just write down one or two more steps. We've got one over one minus q to the n times one over one minus q to the n minus one times a n minus two. Right, so that's how this thing split off with the same thing. And now we'll take that down all the way to the floor. That'll give us one over uh, one minus Q to the N, uh, one minus Q to the N minus one, all the way down to one minus Q. And that's gonna be times A zero. But let's recall A zero is equal to one, so I can just erase that. But now a n is equal to this product right here, but that product has a shortened name, which is one over like that pot camera symbol q n. But let's look at that. If a n is equal to that, that's exactly what we wanted to show from the beginning. So that means we have established this identity over here. Okay. That's the whole test. I don't know, does anyone have any questions? like a lag, huh? A little bit, not too much.
No questions? Mm, so it's a, yeah, not really. <laughs> Good place to stop asking you to do a backflip, but we didn't stop. Ah, yeah, we failed, right? So uh, I couldn't find the GoPro to set up the backflip camera. And then that means I didn't bring the mat out. So, no, I can't, I'm sorry. We're not, we're not set up for that right now. Dalton Tinoco says, do you recommend any books on number theory? Uh, yeah. If you're, look up, look up on Amazon. Uh, Like, just search number theory D. Uh, just maybe click go on that. No, I uh, go to my, uh, so there is a book that I really recommend. And if you're in Europe, you should get it. It's fantastic, but it's sort of hard to get in the US. It's by a Croatian author. It's this number theorist at the University of Zagreb. I forgot his name. Uh, I really like the book a lot. Um, maybe I'll like try to look for it somewhere and post about it. Um, but that's the one I suggest. I think it's really, really, really good. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it? Okay, so should we stop? Is this a good place to stop? Oh, someone asked the Croatian book is written in English. It's yeah, 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 the Croatian book is written in English. I think you can also get it in Croatian if you want, but I have an English copy. Well, someone I know sent me a PDF. Well, someone I know who knows the author, it's like above board, but I have a copy of it and I really wanted to have my class use it, but I couldn't because it was hard to get in the US. But maybe it won't be in the future. Did, did you, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to say his name. Yeah. Good place to stop. Yeah, I think we're good. Well, thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah, maybe we'll do this again.